So if you were a speaker in this session, would you like to come back up to the front? And if you were an audience member in this session and have another question for any of our wonderful panel speakers, we have our microphones in the box going around. There's a question up here, too. Hi. Go ahead. Is this thing on? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, it's questions for Jamie. Um, I'm William Yu from Uni University of Southern California. Uh, <clears throat> for your dust detector, did you ever detect um, the actual micrometeoroids and if you were able to differentiate that between the uh, impact ejecta? Uh, so the yields at the moon we think are something near a thousand. By that I mean you have one particle coming in and you have about a thousand times in mass kicking back up. Um, and so the overwhelming number density is uh, taken up by the impact ejector. Not only that, but what can get into your detector due to the velocity vector addition, it's very difficult. That being said, for seven events out of 140,000, uh, we had t double saturation. So both the electron and the ion signal totally saturated. And it's very difficult to explain that with impact ejector. So it's possible. Um, so I have a question for Addy. Um, it wasn't clear. Um, if you start out with a sample where the um, particle sizes are completely mixed, um, in space, do they separate? Uh, so it turns out, there we go. So it turns out um, at least one of our tubes, when it got to station, was pretty well mixed. Uh, the, the compression didn't work the way we quite thought it was going to. Um, it, we haven't seen anything where it has completely uh, separated into the exact size distributions. You still have a lot of mixing, but as you can see a little bit, it, it seems like there is like the bigger chunks rising to the surface in some areas. So there's this Brazil nut effect, right, where you expect the bigger particles to rise to the surface if you have vibration. Um, and so we're looking to see if we can see some of that. Um, I also have a question. Offer Addy. Um, so, um, uh, when the particles come back down to Earth, that's that's not a smooth fall. No. So, um, how do you how are you uh, 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 dealing with that? Um, yeah. So, um, I, 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 yeah, I try to analyze it after it's gone into. So we. Reentry. When it was turned off on station, we re entrapulated so we recompressed the sample. Um, and so uh, we've, we've seen with other experiments that if you have a compressive overburden on a mixed sample, it will keep it at about the same packing. Um, we've seen that with, with previous experiments we've done. So the idea was that we would have that compressed and packed, and it would stay in basically the same uh, sort of packing and sorting that it was in on station. Um, so. We're going to look at sort of before and after camera video of that, and also we're going to sort of fill it up with epoxy and do cross sections to see how that varies. Uh, Mihai, I'm still blown away by the Mexican jumping bean dust. <laughs> I hadn't seen that before. Um, now, it occurs to me that things like all the Apollo astronaut tracks and moon buggy tracks mm -hmm. are still there. Um, do you? Th have you thought about this? Is there a way that that could the hopping could be happening and those features are still there, or is something suppressing it on the moon uh, to some extent that you're seeing it more in the lab than it's happening on the moon? What what are your thoughts about that? So so let uh, let me answer a different question first. <laughs> so mobilization of dust has been argued for decades since the first surveyor images, and then the laser reflectors showing no degradation for you know, 30 years, people argue that this is clearly not going on. Until you talk to the people who actually knew more about the laser reflectors and they tell you that since day one, since the first night, the efficiency of the return signal is done by an order of magnitude. Uh, as far as the footprints go, I, I don't know what happens when you compress the sample. I don't know what happens when uh, you know, if you were to make a movie of that, what fraction of the tiny particles could still dance around and still make the structure steady? I, I don't have an answer for you other than 
let's figure it out. We have to go there and s have an optical setup that is more a microscope rather than just a handheld camera image that you could look at the tiniest of the population and see what they are doing. But Mi clearly the footprints are. Mi uh, Mihai, um, I have a follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. <laughs> it was, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to ask you this, uh, but we ran out of time. I, it's clear to me wh where I'm coming from. My interest is in uh, you know this dust hopping being essentially a mechanism to aerate soil. So now other bits that have been hiding in the shadows, all of a sudden with this popping of the grains, the continuous popping, you know, become again a source for the atmosphere, because they're now exposed again to the sun. Whereas it would have taken quite a while for them to diffuse around to find the, the light. Uh, so my question now is. Uh, from the rate of expansion of your orange, uh, you know, sample into your lunar, you know, sample, can we estimate sort of a rate of this hopping? Because that's what we would need for models. So, so, so that, that, that's a long-term goal. I, I have to remind you that you know these experiments in no shape and form reproduce lunar conditions. Th these experiments point to a process that might or might not take place there, and we have a long ways to go to make it directly applicable. But I'm sure something like this is going on. We could certainly change the UV flux. We could certainly change the size distribution. There's a lot of things we can do. But I have to remind you, we cannot reproduce lunar conditions. The, the vacuum is not, you know, we can lab vacuum cannot compete with a lunar vacuum and so forth. So it will take a while. We are working towards that goal. Uh, the very idea that uh, lit dark boundary crossing, something is happening, it goes back to Apollo 17. We had the lunar ejector and meteorite experiment when the flux is skyrocketed every time you had this, this uh, changeover from illumination conditions from dark to light, light to dark. So I think the process is real. Uh, I think this process is real. I think we can go a long ways in the lab and then we come back to the experts in planetary science is that what conditions that we cannot meet and how important they could be before uh, reading too much into real efficiencies and real rates, how they might apply at the moon. Well, if we have time and we don't have any more questions, I wanted to give a better response to Rosemary's question during <laughs> um, in the aftermath of my presentation. You asked, uh, what about the uh, highly inclined orbits uh, of long period comets? How do they end up giving you more of the vapor and ejecta near the equator? And I answer partially in saying the, f the mass flux is still in the high latitudes. Uh, what I failed to mention is it's these particles are grazing the surface because they're coming you know, at a steep angle with respect to the vertical. So it's the cosine or cosine cubed of the yield that really suppresses the ejecta, the blanketic rates, in, in other words, should have a clear latitudinal distribution. Um, and I don't know if we see evidence of this at the moment. No more questions? All right. It's your last chance. <laughs> You'll never get another chance to ask this amazing group sitting up here your burning questions. Okay. All right, can we thank all of our other speakers one more?